Good evening, everyone. Wow. Look at you all. A full bookstore. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Sue Smith, and I'm the manager here. And I just want to welcome you. Very warm welcome. We have been planning this for many moons, and we are so glad you're here. If you would all take a moment and put your hand in your purse or your pocket, grab your cell phone and silence it, I appreciate that. I also want to welcome those who are coming to us by Bible Gateway. Welcome. I'd like to have Sandy and Ann come up now. get a chance to look at the book and see um, that her backlist is on sale as well, 50% off. Good. Who here has never heard her speak and speak before? I'm just curious. Wow, amazing. That's fantastic. So who's never read one of her books? Wow. <laughs> And here she is. Well, this lady needs a Our format tonight is we're going to Sandy Vanderzeit, her editor, Anne's editor, is going to come up and we're going to do a little interview. And after that, we're going to open it up to you. As you probably read on the screen, we're going to open it up to questions. And then after that, we will do a book signing. So, very exciting. And we have Sam. And we have Sam. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Everyone welcome Sandy Vanderbilt. You disappeared on us. <laughs> she we took the other way, and you we were waiting in the back way. for him to come out of the bathroom. <laughs> and I, they brought me out this way. <laughs> So anyway, I'm sorry I'm a little bit late, no. <laughs> but um, I'm so happy to be here. I don't know what Sue said about me, but I'll 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 I will tell you. <laughs> I will tell you that I'm associate publisher and executive editor at Sondervan, and I'm Anne's editor. And I just want to thank you so much for joining Anne and the rest of the Zondervan team who is here. And uh, here from Zondervan are. Tom Dean, Robin Barnett, Jessica Westra, and Jennifer Verhaeg from Marketing, and Dirk Bursma from Editorial. So we might want to just give them a little hand. And though most of you know who Ann is, for the few who may not, let me introduce her. Ann is the wife of Daryl, the farmer of pigs, and of wheat, of corn, and of soybeans. She is the mother of seven children, ages 21 to 2. Her latest addition to the family is Shiloh, who was adopted from China last spring. So she's been with the family only six months. Um, and Anne lives in a small town in Ontario. And you've probably never heard of it. Um, but it is 40 minutes from Kitchener-Waterloo and about 90 minutes from Toronto, where I think you all know about Toronto. So. And she is the author of the 66-week New York Times best-selling book, One Thousand Gifts, and also of two Advent devotional books, The Greatest Gift and Unwrapping the Greatest Gift. And I also like to say that she is a prophet who calls especially women to be Esthers in their own generation and to do hard and holy things. 
so in. Um, as um, Sue said, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then you get to ask a few questions. So, first, um, one thousand gifts was the story of giving thanks that changed your life. Um, and tell us a bit about how the broken way has shaped and formed your life. Um, the broken way really is. Um, the book end to 1,000 Gifts. The two go together. Um, I really believe that the heart of the Christian faith is the Lord's Supper. That Jesus calls us to do this again and again and again. It's reenacting our faith. We're to take everything and give thanks for it. Eucharist Deo. And that's what we explored in 1,000 Gifts. And then in a broken way, what does Jesus do with it when he's taken and he's given thanks? He doesn't hoard that gift. He doesn't keep that gift to himself. He takes it and he breaks it and he gives. I think um, the broken way really has literally reshaped, reformed, transformed my life. Because it's it's the other end of 1,000 gifts. I, I pen it every day on my wrist over top of the scars where I used to cut myself, my new identity. I want to cruciform. All of the gifts come down from heaven as grace. And my gratitude rises up. That's that vertical beam of the cross. And then that horizontal being, that's to live broken and given out into a broken-hearted world through my own brokenness. So literally, the broken way has transformed, reformed, reshaped my life, all of my life, the shape of my days, the shape of my moments, of my words, my actions, to literally be cruciform, broken and given, because I believe that living shaped like a cross is the abundant life. Thank you. You wrote The Broken Way out of a raw, um, honest, and vulnerable place. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a bit about what you hope readers might find in its pages. Oh, well, ultimately, first and foremost, I hope you find Jesus in the pages. Um, I, think, I think the more open and honest and vulnerable we can be to tear off our masks, and be real about our brokenness. It allows Christ to be seen in our life, to our neighbors, in our church, in our community. So I hope, I hope the rawness and the realness is a way of lending courage to people to be able to say, I'm broken too. When we go ahead and we say, we have it all together, we mask our brokenness. What we're really doing is we're, we're masking Christ in our life. We're covering up Christ and I'm saying, all the strength you see is really me, as opposed to living broken and saying, I am so weak and broken. All the strength you see is really Christ. Um, I think 1,000 Gifts was about um, giving thanks. And the broken way really is about realizing that the most powerful word is, is givenness. God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave. So 1,000 Gifts is about giving thanks to the Lord. And the broken way is about how do I live now just given, surrender to Him and a givenness out into the world. So I think regardless of whatever situation we find ourselves in, the answer always is givenness. How do I give thanks in the situation? And how do I live given to the situation, to Christ, to the people right here? So I, I hope the broken way really helps to, to wrestle out three big questions in your life. What do you do with your one broken heart? The question you can't afford not to have the answer to is, what do I do with brokenness? Because all of us are gonna experience deep loss and pain. You wake up one morning and the life you had yesterday doesn't exist anymore. What do you do with your one broken heart? What's the answer to pain and suffering in the world? We as believers need to know what that answer is. And the world outside of the church is asking us, what is the answer to pain and suffering in the world? Do you know what that answer is? Because that's what they need to know before they come to the Lord. Why is there pain and suffering? So the broken way is wrestling out that question. And then ultimately, we're all looking for the abundant life. What does abundant life look like in the midst of brokenness? So those are the things I was really wrestling out in the pages of the broken way. Great. Thank you. Um, in The Broken Way, you write about koinonia, hmm. and say that koinonia is more than a cup of coffee and small talk. It is the fellowship 
of the broken, sharing brokenness. Mm -hmm. um, in 1000 Gifts, you wrote that Eucharisteo always precedes the miracle. And in The Broken Money, you write, Koinonia is always, always, always the miracle. Would you unpack that a bit for us? Yeah. What is Koinonia and why is it the miracle that you need? Mm -hmm. Koinonia, I mean, it's a, it's a, if Eucharist Day was quote unquote a new word, it, it, it wasn't. It comes out of right there, he gave thanks, that's the word Eucharist Day of. Um, Chorus, everything is grace, receive it, give thanks, and there is joy, chorus. So those three terms were embodied in Eucharisteo. Um, koinonia is what you're doing right there at the Lord's Supper. It's communion. We, we use the word koinonia, it's a word that we're much more familiar with than Eucharisteo. We see it as fellowship, we often think of it as coffee hour, <laughs> which is sort of a veneer, shallow understanding of what it really means. He's asking us to participate in the sufferings of Christ. He's asking us to have koinonia with each other, which is really the fellowship of the broken. He's asking you to enter into deep vulnerability and, and being entering into a life of generosity with vulnerability, that you're giving your one broken heart to each other. So it's, it's calling you to a much deeper life. And I think why it's so critical is because ultimate reality is, is not what it's not the American dream. It's not having things. It's not having stuff. The ultimate reality is relationship. And we see that in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit living in relationship. You think of your own life. What is the ultimate reality? What means the most to you is always relationship. It's relationship you have with the Lord. It's the relationship we have as a body of believers. It's relationship we have with other people. So if relationship is the ultimate reality, koinonia, deep fellowship, is always, always, always the miracle that we get when we do what? When we live in vulnerability, humility, and generosity. It's daring to take the broken way. Break open your heart and be real and honors and giving to each other. And then we get ushered in to the miracle of koinonia, not only with each other, but a deep communion and intimacy with God. Because as we give to each other, we're giving to the Lord. All there is to ever see is Jesus. Jesus in the face of the people around us and praying that they see the face of Jesus in us. So really, we're doing everything in communion with Christ and in community with each other. So I really believe that Koinonia is always, always, always the grace, the miracle that he gives us each other and more and more of himself. Great. A new understanding of Koinonia. Koinonia that I hope is, is much deeper that, that gives us the courage to go ahead and do more than drink coffee with each other, but drink more and more of the, the depths of his love by our own, us being authentic and real and genuine with each other. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And speaking of vulnerability, um, mm. you tell a lot of wonderful stories mm. in The Broken Way. Um, you, you alluded to the story that opens the book about you cutting when you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could tell the audience, of all the stories you tell, what is your favorite story? That's like asking to pick who is your favorite child. <laughs> Oh, Sandy, what's my favorite story? There's so many. There's there the, are. The farmer was the farmer washing from my feet at night when I came in. There's a story of my mama and I being oh, over to mother's story. Real. Yes. Yeah. Um, just cutting Joshua's hair before I went to university. Um, the story of Malachi's diagnosis of being um, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe the one that's shaped me the most, um, March of 2015, um, three weeks after um, the 21 were martyred in Libya by ISIS, they were beheaded. Um, I was invited to go into Iraq, um, and my children said, oh, Mama, you wouldn't do that, would you? <laughs> I said, no, your mama would not do something like that. But my husband said, you are more safe 
and the will of God, then you are staying here if that's not the will of God. And the will of God is that you go and tell the stories of people who don't have voices. Because it could be us someday facing evil that is incomprehensible. And you would want someone to have the courage to say, yes, I will go and tell those stories. Um, so I stood at the back door of the house and said goodbye to everybody to get on a plane to leave. And my oldest son, Caleb, said to me, just before I left, and all the younger ones, um, Malachi and Shalom were there, um, <laughs> Caleb said, okay, Mama, go do what you're called to do. Keep your head on your shoulders. <laughs> Shalom cried harder and hugged me tighter. <laughs> um, so I flew, I, I first, the Lord was so gracious and kind, I had a, a week in Israel. So walk the way that Jesus walked, the broken way, live cruciform, broken and given. And when I was finished my, my week in Israel, I flew with Lynn Hoggles to um, into Iraq. We flew in a plane. Um, we were the only two women on the plane. Uh, flew into Jordan at um, 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> Waited for a layover to fly into um, to Iraq. Um, we landed. We, at that point in time, we were in Terrebil. We, um, that one were only about 40 miles from ISIS. I was in Iraq for four and a half days and went and sat with um, women who had uh, seen their husbands and their brothers shot and killed at the head by ISIS. Had to choose in the moment which of their children, they might have two arms, which of their children they could scoop up and run with up Mount Sinjar, and having little children, five, six, seven, they didn't know where those children were. Um, women who hadn't been given the privilege of an education, all they could do to sign their name was their, their thumbprint. Looking into their eyes and thinking, what's next for you? <laughs> How do you raise these children? What do you do? And. Um, Knowing that they uh, they were telling their stories, that we would be a good steward of those stories. I realized in that moment when sitting in shipping containers with those women, after I had counted out a thousand blessings and haven't stopped counting all of the gifts and all of the grace that I've been given, we are Esther living in the palace. <laughs> We have been given grace upon grace upon grace. And now, there are people outside the gate who are counting on you, to you in your position that you have been given, to risk it all for those outside the gate. After I came home, someone at church said, it's really nice that you care about those people over there. I want to cut their faces and say, ah, oh, but we all are called to this. This is why you are here for such a time as this. Counting a thousand gifts, contemplating all of the gifts I've been given has made me an activist. The gift is always meant to be given, to be broken and given out into a broken-hearted world. We are all called to be the Esther generation. Mordecai says to Esther, if you do not use your position and risk it all for those outside the gate, I'm not doing something wrong. <laughs> um, Where's Keith? <laughs> it's the air conditioning. It's the air conditioning. It's loud. It's all good. <laughs> um, if you don't use your position for those outside the gate, God may use another means to free those people. But you and your family will die. If we don't use our position for those outside the gate and choose to live cruciform, broken and given, we are the living dead. We are the ones walking around with, a, with no meaningful purpose. We are the ones that live hollow lives. So I think carrying those women's stories has, has spurred us on in deep ways. How do I live cruciform and given? Esther was like Christ. If I die, I die. Christ was, I die, I die. He sacrificed it all for us. And Esther is showing us that as women, we are welcomed in, beckoned in, to use the position that we've been given for those outside the gate. So this past year, 
um, as I was filling out a Mount Everest of forms <laughs> um, to process Shadow's adoption and bring her home from China. Shadow has a, she literally has a broken heart. She is half of a heart. Um, Daryl, my husband, um, began to fill out forms after Alan Curdy, the little, the little boy who died, um, drowned their family trying to get to Canada, Syrian refugees. There was sort of a forms to bring over a refugee family from Syria. And our family has been with us now for three weeks. They landed um, at the Toronto airport. Um, a mom and a dad and four children, a family of six with three backpacks, which all their worldly possessions. They didn't know there was going to be anybody there to greet them. We were holding a sign in Arabic for them. And um, they were so surprised that it was their family name. Who are these people? <laughs> and um, we had a translator with us and uh, explained to them that we had, a, we had a home waiting for them, that we rented for them for a full year, that's fully furnished for them, that we would help them learn English, and we would get them a job, and, and we were going to walk beside them for everything they needed for a full year. And they said, oh, they thought they would get four nights in a hotel, and then they would be on their own. And this week, um, the father turned to my husband as Daryl went to leave the house. He said to them, you are like a brother to me. We're called to use all the gifts that we've been given now to be broken and given out into the world. We can say, I don't have enough in me to do this. <laughs> I, I, I can't do this. I'm already maxed out. And in and of ourselves, we are maxed out. And the broken way explores the fact that we are broken. You don't have to have it together. Jesus is in you, and he does all of this. And, and you look at what's happening in the world right now. You look at what's happening politically right now. We are called for such a time as now to start a revolution of being the gift, of being broken and given, and giving it forward to show a broken-hearted world that we are the hands and feet of Jesus, and they are seen, and they are relentlessly loved, and the hounds of heaven will not stop pursuing them. And it begins with us saying yes. That was a long, but marvelous answer to my simple question. That was my editor editing my answer. <laughs> and that's really all I have, so I have... <laughs> she doesn't want to ask me another question. No, those are the, all the other questions I had, so I'm going to um, read a couple questions from you guys. And I forgot to... Uh, welcome our Bible Gateway um, audience. Um, we are streaming this for Bible Gateway, so welcome to all you who are, are streaming. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. <laughs> and um, the first question is, thank you for telling the story of your adopted daughter's brokenness in terms of her heart surgery. What encouragement would you offer other parents of children with heart disease who struggle with the question of, why my child? Uh, I think um, Shadow had open heart surgery, her second open heart surgery. Uh, she will have three, so let alone one next summer. Um, so when she had her um, second heart surgery this August, um, we were at Toronto State Kids Hospital meeting other families who also were the same boat that we were in. But ours is different. Everyone, nurses would ask us, doctors would ask us, did you know this about her before you adopted her? And we did. We made a choice. Which is very different than a mother and a father who have dreams and hopes for a child and then find out, ah, oh, the Lord has given us something different than what we intended. Um, I think of wrestling through God is always, always good and I am always, always loved. That everything that He gives is a gift. Um, I think the gift we get, and with these children that have these congenital heart defects, we don't know how long their lives are. Shallow's heart surgery is a series of three heart surgeries that will still be palliated, but only at some point in time there's a heart transplant in our future. Um, we pray. It's a realization that every day is a gift. That gives you an awareness that other people don't have, that you take time and see it is so profoundly 
precious. I think um, to realize that sometimes the hardest roads, the roads that look like the most broken way, is going to lead you into a deeper intimacy with Christ. Sometimes the cold drives you closer to the fire to see that this hard situation is going to shape you more like Jesus and you will know him far more intimately cling to him in a way that you would never would have known him otherwise. And ultimately that abundant life is what? To have more and more of God. So to see him, to look so counterculture and upside down to see that my, what the world might say is a broken thing. It's actually a beautiful thing. Great, thank you. Second question from the audience. What is the one thing you would say to someone with a fairly tragedy-free life who is struggling with doubt about God? <laughs> I, asked easier my questions. I asked easier questions. Uh, the doubt is a gift, too. God's not afraid of questions at all. God's not afraid of you going ahead and saying, I don't understand why. Um, I think I think sometimes we think we need answers, we need explanations, and ultimately what our heart really is crying for is an encounter and experience of God. And I think we experience him because you know, people carry around the image of God. We're made in the image and likeness of God. People are the Imago Dei. So go out into the world, live cruciform in the midst of your doubts, in the midst of your questions, live broken and given out into the world, and you will encounter Christ in people in ways that you never would have expected. But I think answer the questions, and you can live into the, the questions. God's okay with the questions. Go ahead and live into living like Christ, and the abundance comes in answers that you wouldn't have imagined. Great. Thank you. One last question. Um, you said this on Twitter. When the church isn't for the suffering and broken, then the church isn't for Christ. And the question is, what is a practical way of suffering for good? Um, life comes out of broke, the broken way. Um, after my sister was killed, when I was four years old, in front of my mother and I, um, she was crushed by a truck in our church, our farmyard. And I was at church in my teens, I was 18. Um, all through my teen years, I was cutting in my, my mom was in psychiatric wards, trying to process the horror of watching your child killed in front of you. And um, a pastor had, had laughed and said that uh, several years ago, he lived next to a living bin, and, and the congregation had laughed. And, Pain and shame I didn't feel. Um, shame is a bully, but grace is a shield. The church needs to be that shield, that grace for the broken. Or why would the broken ever shadow the doors of the church? Um, and I think the broken way is trying to, is encouraging us, begging us for such a time as now not to turn away from brokenness. Brokenness out in the world, brokenness in our churches, brokenness in our own families. I mean, culture is constantly telling us avoid suffering at all costs. <laughs> avoid suffering as we approach death. Avoid suffering out in the world. You're trying to look for a comfortable life. But Christ, where does Christ go to? Christ goes to the suffering, broken hearted places. Why do we as the church try to avoid those places? Um, I wrestled through in the broken way that bad brokenness in the world, the brokenness that inhibits human flourishing, the brokenness that's detrimental. Bad brokenness is broken by good brokenness, by us living broken and given into suffering places, into hurting places. The answer to pain and suffering in the world is, is to not turn away from suffering and brokenness. We get overwhelmed by it. We can see it, it's, it's constantly running in the headlines on our Facebook streams, we get overwhelmed by brokenness. But if we could just say, when I see one little bit of brokenness today, I'm not going to turn away from it. We feel along for the fissures and the fractures in the world, and then we take our one broken heart and break off bits of our heart and pour it into those, those open wounds in the world. So I think we, we, we're called to be compassionate, 
compassionate meaning suffering, co-suffering with people. Enter into the sufferings of Christ, into the sufferings of the world. Live broken and given into those places. And that's because you become part of the answer to suffering in the world. We're called to be a body to go out into those broken-hearted places, pour a bit of Christ, his hands and his feet into those broken places. So I think witness breaks brokenness, and bad brokenness is broken by good brokenness. That's great. Bad brokenness is broken, broken by, by good, good brokenness. Thank you, Anne. That's really all you have time for. And before Keith comes up to tell you how the book signing is going to work, I want to let you know that this is the second stop on Anne's 10 City um, book tour. Um, and she is going to be going to Chicago tomorrow. Uh, next week it'll be Nashville, it'll be Dallas, it'll be Atlanta. Um, I think all the cities are on her blog. You can look for the book tour cities there. If you have friends in those cities, encourage them to come and meet Anne. And let's thank Anne. Thank you for coming out here and being willing to share and share and honest. Um,